struggled with this sermon because they said it all. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, it, was, it was hard to come up with words to amplify those readings. But I did come up with some. <laughs> How many of you needed that poem that Bill read about the good news? You needed that feeling a little wash in the bad news? Did it resonate? Unfortunately, the bad news isn't just in print anymore. It's in our pockets, in our purses, in our hands, it's on our wrists sometimes, in our earbuds. It's everywhere, it seems. All the more reason for us to be disciplined in seeking out the good news, reading those special editions of goodness that arrive every moment, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, no matter what else is happening. What's your good news? Each day when I drag myself out of bed, and I mean drag because I am not a morning person, my old dog drags himself up from the floor to greet me, tail wagging. He's old and stiff, and he has a tumor in his abdomen that will rupture any day now, the vet told us a year ago. Every morning, this beloved being, this Buddha with a ticking time bomb in his belly, rises, tail wagging to greet me. And no matter what else is going on, I get down on my knees and give him a good, long snuggle, literally breathing him in. I like his smell. <laughs> I do. We love the smell of the people and animals we love. My alarm clock rouses me from sleep. I hate that alarm clock. But my old dog wakes me up, bringing me back the present moment and how precious it is. And for that moment, I am filled with love and peace. Breathing in, I inhale my old dog. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is a wonderful moment. Good news, bad news, it all depends on where we put our attention. Because there is good and bad in every moment, in every person, place, and time. Being in touch with goodness helps us stay present to the bad. Buddhism is a non-dualistic tradition. It's more about both and than either or. The practice is to stay present with whatever is happening. So it's not about blocking out the bad news. That's real stuff that's happening, and it matters, and it's bad. It's about learning not to get lost in the suffering, learning to grow what's good. In the reading Noreen did, Joanna Macy says the first teaching of engaged Buddhists is don't turn away. Stay present. Our full presence is the greatest gift we can give to our world and others. This is the first noble truth of the Buddha's teaching, and this is the boundless heart of the Bodhisattva. Not to be afraid of the suffering, but to let it be known and touched. That takes courage in a society addicted to comfort. But until that happens, there is no healing. We might see what is happening right now in the United States as a result of the dominant culture's refusal to stay present with suffering. Refusal even to acknowledge it, which means we can't address it in any meaningful way. The massive suffering, past and present, caused by European colonization and enslavement has never been truly faced, never been acknowledged in a way that might lead to healing. The backlash that the MAGA movement is riding, the book bans, attacks on diversity,
diversity, equity, and inclusion, the denial that systemic oppression even exists at all, the denial that climate change is real, or that we depend on each other to survive. These are all efforts to push away suffering and brokenness, and they will only cause more suffering, more brokenness. From a Buddhist perspective, that's how suffering works, be it individual or collective. In order to transform ourselves and the world, we have to build our capacity to be present, to ground and calm ourselves so we don't add fuel to the fires of suffering. When we act out of fear, hatred, and delusion, the three poisons of Buddhists call them, we add fuel to the fires of suffering. It's easy to see how this works when we're looking at the actions of others, but it's true for all of us. Because unless we're enlightened, we all act out of fear, hatred, and delusion sometimes, maybe lots of times. I know I do. What Siddhartha Gautama realized some 2,500 years ago when meditating under a tree in present-day India is simply how things are. Seeking an end to human suffering, he had tried various forms of spiritual practice, extreme asceticism among them, but none of them worked. So he sat under a fig tree in meditation, where eventually, after battling various temptations to distract him, he saw deeply into the true nature of things. He saw how everything in existence is impermanent and interdependent, always in flux, rising and falling. And he saw how humans, not understanding this, seek happiness where it simply can't be found. <coughs> Seek permanence where there is none. Seek individual safety and success when there is no ultimate separation between self and other, this or that. Until we understand the true nature of existence, we're destined to keep the fires of suffering burning for ourselves and others through thoughts and actions that can never bring lasting happiness or peace. <coughs> If we want true happiness, liberation from suffering, we have to awaken to reality as it actually is. Then, understanding our situation fully, we can choose a response that leads to more peace and less suffering. Enlightenment, then, is simply awakening to the true nature of existence as it unfolds in the present moment causing our restless minds and bodies to simply be here, now, noticing whatever is arising and falling inside and all around us, and choosing a response that leads to more freedom, more peace, more happiness. This is awakening, and it's available to everyone, no matter their religion or culture. We all have the capacity to awaken, this is what Buddhists call Buddha nature. Thich Nhat Hanh says, we're all Buddhas to be. Don't take my word for it. Try and seek for yourself. This is in a very, very general nutshell, the Buddhist path, the way that I understand it and have learned it. Although it takes many, many forms, there are many branches and lineages of Buddhism Engaged Buddhism is simply Buddhist teachings and practices applied to contemporary social and ecological ills. Traditional Buddhist practice has focused mostly on personal transformation. Engaged Buddhism broadens the focus to include social transformation as well. For engaged Buddhists, individual and collective liberation go hand in hand. There is no separation and both individual and collective liberation depend on our capacity to be fully present. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is a wonderful moment. These mindfulness mantras sound so sweet, 
and gentle, don't they? Like Thich Nhat Hanh himself, who was, if you've ever seen images of him or seen him in person even, who was very small and very, very gentle in everything he did. Just like his mindfulness mantras. But that gentleness can be a deception because spiritually speaking, it's strong as kryptonite. Engage Buddhism was born in the fires of the Vietnam War in the 1950s. A novice monk at the time, Thich Nhat Hanh and other young monks in Vietnam wanted to form a Buddhism more responsive to the needs of the world. Nhat Hanh says of that time, when bombs begin to fall on people, you cannot stay in the meditation hall all the time. You have to bring your meditation practice into the world. So that's what he and a group of fellow young monastics did. They applied the teachings of the Buddha and their meditation practice to the context of war, doing relief work, helping to rebuild bombed villages, rescuing refugees stranded at sea. This work was so difficult, so dangerous and traumatic that Nat Han and his friends quickly learned they needed their meditation practice in order to sustain it. The suffering we touch doing this kind of work, he writes, was so deep that if we did not have a reservoir of spiritual strength, we would not have been able to continue. During those days, we practiced sitting and walking meditation and eating our meals in silence in a very concentrated way. We knew that without this kind of discipline, we would fail in our work. The lives of many people depended on our mindfulness practice. Think about that for a moment. The lives of many people depended on our mindfulness practice. Not on us, but on our mindfulness practice. How often do we think the lives of many people depend on our Unitarian Universalist practice. The lives of many people do depend on faithful UU practice, of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. What are our shared UU values? Interdependence, equity, transformation, pluralism, generosity, and justice with love at the center. I imagine Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King understood that countless lives depended on their spiritual practice as well. They had to be serious about their spiritual practice in order to be present to suffering, hatred, and violence without adding to it or becoming it. They knew their efforts for peace and justice had to be grounded in spiritual practice if they were actually going to transform collective suffering. Engaged Buddhism arose out of the realization that when bombs are falling, sitting in meditation is not enough. And neither is just taking action enough. Nhat Han realized that action must embody mindfulness. If there is no awareness, action will only cause more harm. I want to draw a parallel here to our Unitarian Universalist emphasis on love. We covenant to live our values, to do whatever it is we do in a spirit of love. Our UU tradition is very engaged in the world in efforts for social change, but if we don't root our efforts in the spiritual discipline of love, we're at risk of causing more harm, not less. Breathing in, I am aware. Breathing out, I am here talking to you. Breathing in, I am aware. I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> Breathing out, I'm about to wrap up. <laughs> Soon after the presidential election of 2016, James Ishmael Ford, a Zen Buddhist priest and a Unitarian Universalist minister, wrote the following. What to do, what to do now? 
For me, the bottom line is recalling there is no separation. We have to act. There is no alternative. But what will that action look like? More hate? More blame and condemnations? Or can we genuinely recall that there is, in the last analysis, no goal, but only the path? I think, feel, believe. If we can recall that last thing, we are all of us in this together. We are all of us, at the end, one. Well, then ways through will appear. We are all of us in this together. That's why to transform the world, we have to transform ourselves. And to transform ourselves, we have to transform the world. This is engaged Buddhism, and it's also Unitarian Universalism. So whether we call it engaged presence, or we call it transforming love, let's practice it together. Breathing in, breathing out, for the benefit of all. May it be so, and amen.